So, um, yeah, thanks to everybody for inviting me here today. Um, I run a practice called ScanLab Projects, um, which is a group of um, seven people at the moment. Julia in the front row is uh, another member of ScanLab. Um, we explore the world through the eyes of a very special piece of technology, uh, the terrestrial laser scanner. Not many of you will have heard of the terrestrial laser scanner at the moment. By the end of uh, my talk today, you'll hopefully know a little bit about it. In five years' time, I reckon you'll probably have one on your phone. So we, we, we understand this technology very well. And, and because of our knowledge of this technology, we get invited to some amazing places. Um, we get asked to collaborate with some wonderful people who I would never have the opportunity to meet if it wasn't for my knowledge of this machine. What I'm going to do now is just um, play a showreel of some of the places and some of the, the um, projects that we've collaborated with over the last few years. places that you see on the screen at the moment, these are, these are real places. Um, they're physical objects, events, or constructions that exist in the real world. And we use laser scanning to digitize those, those physical manifestations and make some sort of experience on from, from that simple digitization. Sometimes it's images that we make, sometimes it's films, sometimes it's objects, sometimes it's virtual reality experiences. But always there's a real life moment that we, that we start with there. And always our aim is to transport people back to that space or to tell some sort of story about this, this place that we've been able to visit. I'm going to very, very quickly show you how that works. So this is our laser scanner. It sits on a tripod. It spins around. It fires out lasers, which bounce off every surface that it sees. It measures about a million points a second. So we end up with these models of a space. This is a room uh, in the center of London that's made up, if I zoom into it, of millions and millions. Oh, come on, slides, work with me. Yeah, millions and millions of little dots. These dots are precise to the millimeter. They're in exactly the right place in digital space. We can also color those dots so they look the right colors. They look the same colors as you or I would see them with our human eyes. And if we link lots of individual scans together, what we end up with is a perfect digital replica of a real life space that we can then move around in, in the computer, explore, take images from. We can do this with tiny objects. This is Lord Nelson's uh, dracket, uh, jacket that he was shot and eventually died from those injuries in the Battle of Trafalgar. We, we digitized this object so that it's a very precious object. You're not allowed to touch this in the National Maritime Night. National Maritime Museum, where it is at the moment. But what you can do via our digital model is spin that object around, zoom into it, and almost digitally touch it. We also do this to vast landscapes. So this is terrestrial, or this is laser scanning, not terrestrially, from a little drone that's flying over this area. 
of the Perbex uh, in Dorset, and then we switch to terrestrial laser scanning down on this level here. So, so vast swathes of the landscape can be digitized in this way. This technology has been to some amazing places before I came into contact with it about six or seven years ago. It was actually invented to understand the surface of the moon so that we could land a lunar module on there. And one of the early uses was to fly around above the Earth and send these lasers through the clouds to understand the density of clouds and ultimately map, map the weather. It's now the technology that allows driverless vehicles to understand the objects moving around them and navigate safely through the city. And as I said a second ago, it will be the next technology that comes onto all of your mobile phones. So this is um, Project Tango by Google, which was launched about a year and a half ago. It's essentially our technology on a mobile phone. So I wanted to ask to everybody in the room what they'll, what they'll do with this once it's on their mobile phone. How will your selfie work when it's not just um, that viewpoint that you capture from, from the front of a, of a portrait, but when you can look at it from many sides, or when the person in the photograph is, uh, or the room that you take that photograph in is equally as important as the person that you're taking the photo of. So what happens when your photograph can start to move and, and the people that are originally looking at a camera that's in front of them, they themselves are actually observed from the side or they themselves, they themselves are observed from behind. It completely kind of transforms the idea of taking a photograph, which is capturing a moment that doesn't change. We can capture a moment, but then we can explore that moment from every possible angle, from down below the ground, from behind the walls. We can disappear through the architecture. This, this, th these data sets that we're creating here are kind of soft and fluffy, and we can fly through the walls, and we can push that dust aside. So where have we taken this technology? Um, we were lucky enough to be involved in a project um, for the BBC last year, um, which took us to Rome. And not just the kind of um, bits of Rome that you see as a tourist, but actually these amazing underground spaces that allowed Rome to, uh, that allowed ancient Rome to exist and become this kind of incredible city that we all know and love. So myself and Soma, one of my colleagues, uh, are here exploring the aqueducts, which ran for 20 kilometers underneath the city of Rome 2,000 years ago and brought fresh water into the city. We were also lowered down manhole covers into a series of, qua a series of quarries and caves, which is where they mined Pozzolana and Tufa, which allowed the Romans to, for example, build uh, the very first concrete structures in the world. And the interest for us here wasn't just exploring and mapping those underground spaces, but it was to relate them to the everyday world that you see and know above. So you'd end up with these very kind of traditional architectural spaces, rooms that, that you and I would recognize, and then these strange kind of root-like quarry systems that exist just below and just next to the, the normal kind of visible world. I'm just going to play a short intro to that program. Could we pop the sound up? Please? For 1,000 years, the beating heart of the ancient world. Capital city of the most powerful empire on the planet. But this iconic cityscape tells only half the story. Every modern city is served by its underground spaces. Deep beneath Rome's glorious domes and columns lies a secret underground powerhouse that made life possible for a million citizens up above. I love Rome. Of all the places in the world... We'll skip Alexander Armstrong doing his cheesy intro there. Um, but I guess one of the most amazing things about my job is that I get to go to these places, but I don't go there alone. I go there with people that know them intimately. They either discovered them or they've been studying them for years and years and years. And so they don't just tell me these amazing stories when we're there. We scan these spaces, and then we explore them again with these experts, and they make new discoveries. So we see this real excitement of a fresh understanding of a space from somebody that thought they knew everything about that place. There's another bit of video. The honeycombs of quarries that made Rome's building revolution. The aqueducts and sewers that supplied and cleansed it. will uncover underground cults. And finally, 
the places that received its dead. This invisible treasure trove will reveal the secrets of the world's most remarkable ancient city, both below, I've never been in a sewer before, I hear it's great, and above ground. Welcome to Invisible Rome. I'm going to ditch Alexander and go with Bradley next time. I think it's going to be much more fun. Um, OK, I've got two more projects to get through, and I also want to show you a scan that we did of this very room about uh, an hour ago. So I'm going to go very, very quickly. Sometimes television screens are not good enough to, um, to present this data in. So I'm going to show you a project now which takes a 3D scan of the Brazilian rainforest into virtual reality. Um, this is a If you want a bit more jungle-type virtual reality action as well, some of our friends, Marshmallow Laser, Laser Feast, are in the interactive zone. I would encourage you to go and pop on one of their headsets and have a little wander around a jungle. Final place I want to take you guys. This is uh, 79 degrees north. This is in the Arctic Circle. The boat in the middle of the screen here is Greenpeace's, icebre Greenpeace's icebreaker, the Arctic Sunrise. This is actually the very first project that we did at ScanLab Projects. It came out of a conversation that I had in a pub about, with a guy who was just about to go on this boat and just about to go and explore the Arctic. He was complaining that he didn't know how to use a strange piece of technology, a laser scanner. I happen to be one of the only about 25 people in the world, who, in, in the UK at that moment in time, who knew how to use that technology. So five days later, I was on a ship, well, a plane, two planes, helicopter, ship in the Arctic. Uh, the reason that we were there on this beautiful ship is that they would actually drop us off the side of the ship onto these floating pieces of ice. Uh, we would set up our machine. It was a wee bit bigger and a wee bit clunkier then. We would digitize the top surface of, the piece of, the, of, of this frozen piece of the ocean. We were working with a whole... So we're working with an amazing team of experts there, um, mapping the top surface of the ice, but also drilling holes to understand how thick it was, taking ice samples to understand how old this ice was, and some amazing little um, autonomous vehicles that would disappear underneath the ice as well and map it from the underside. So what we were collecting here was some of the most um, accurate, spatial information about these pieces of ice that's ever been collected in the world. And these data sets are now used by CR scientists across the world to, from the comfort of their desks, understand sea ice morphology. So this is like the kind of the micro scale for them almost. They, they start their work on the scale of, a, of satellite images. They go right the way down through a series of photographs to our 3D scans, which are accurate to the millimeter of the size and shape of these pieces of ice. Polar bears also up in the Arctic. Uh, that's one playing with one of our reference spheres that links our scans together there. Lovely guys, but when you, hear a, when you get the shout from the ship that a polar bear is coming, you do not want to be on the ice anymore. They look nice and fluffy, but they, uh, they eat humans for breakfast. OK, I'm on a red light here, so I'm going to go 30 more seconds. It wasn't good enough for us that that 3D data was used by a bunch of scientists to discover new things about the Arctic. We wanted everybody to be able to share that experience with us. So to cut a very long story short, we 3D printed those pieces of ice. We mapped out the bottom underside of them. We made some nice molds. We filled them up with water. We stuck them in a very big freezer. And we ended up with perfect 1 to 100 scale replicas of these pieces of ice, which we installed in a gallery in London uh, three years ago now. And what was amazing about this space was that when you walked into this room, 
it's almost if we'd exactly put a load of big fresh pieces of ice in yeah. here, so that room was that, freezing. That level of perfect detail, but then of course oh, it melts. Can we melts. kill my horrible double voice? Um, and as, the, uh, as people walked into that room, their breath and then being in that room made the ice melt quicker. So it was this kind of perfect analogy for what's going on in the Arctic. Okay, I'm going to end there and show you very, very quickly, I'm sorry I'm overrunning, um, a scan that we performed in this very room about an hour ago. So I think we're going to switch to another computer, hopefully. Oop. Okay, so Julia is going to act as navigator here. This, you guys might get some strange digital deja vu here because you will remember being sat in a slightly different place an hour and a half ago, um, and you will appear in that position inside this scan here. So what we've got here is somewhere in the region of half a billion individual measurements that were taken over the course of about seven or eight minutes. It maps every surface that the laser scanner could see, and it maps it in tiny, tiny individual points. We haven't got the color information here, we've just got the black and white information. And what we'll do, we've um, soloed out a few people from the audience, and we'll just have a little zoom in. So if anybody recognizes themselves, give us a shout. So if we're going to end with some closing remarks, the thing that I'd say to everybody in the room is, well, two things. One, you'll have this on your phone so soon, so do something fun with it and get your selfie from the side face ready. Um, and the second thing is embrace technology and become an expert in technology because you never know where it will take you. Thanks very much. That was incredible. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you, said you mentioned Project Tango. Um, tell us a little bit more about how soon we're going to be able to start playing with that ourselves. And for those people here who might be impatient and want to do it now, what's the best way to get started? Um, well, this, this technology is kind of already happening. I think the interesting thing about this technology and, and what our practice try and do is that normally these sensors aren't meant for humans to look at the data from them. They're meant for things like driverless vehicles not to crash into people and the driverless vehicle does that not by showing you what it's seeing but just by not crashing um, so our practice and what i encourage other people to do is to try and kind of like hack a little bit back beyond and try and see through the eyes of those machines if you want to start playing with it now i mean the microsoft connect is essentially a 3d laser scanner it's actually got a frame rate as well you can buy a um, Microsoft Connect relatively cheaply. You can have a little Google and you can 3D scan your face in probably about the first five minutes. Um, so that's a good way in. I'm going to be doing that when I get home. Everyone, please give a round of applause to Matt Shaw. <laughs> <Down our project. laughs>